My name is Michael Anderson. I know most of you guys. Um, you're familiar with the Tectonic uh, Tuesday format. And uh, so welcome to um, what I'm calling a uh, broadband workshop because I'm going to ask for some things from you guys when we get towards the end. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about broadband in Nevada County for a really long time. And there's been projects here, projects there, but uh, we're still not where we really need to be. Um, and uh, we, need, we need to look at the future and say, okay, wh wh what do we want to be? Where do we want to be with broadband in 2030 or even 2050? What, what does it look like in Nevada County? And not just in Nevada County, but the rural, the rural United States, really, because that's where the problem is. Um, there are problems in the cities. There are holes in various places due to the incumbents maybe not serving particular areas in the um, more dense um, urban and exurban uh, areas. But um, rural is really where where the problem is, and and it's it's universally recognized. And for some reason, we just can't seem to figure it out. Well, um, we're starting to come to some solutions. Um, the main thing is to look at broadband not necessarily as a uh, a service like um, something that uh, you know you buy a car or you get a cell phone or you, you take an airplane ride. So you just kind of choose whoever you decide is going to give you that service today at the best price for the best level of service. It's infrastructure. So you're kind of stuck with what's there, what's installed. Um, and that's really what the issue is about, is about the fact that uh, it's a utility and it's not really treated as a utility in the United States, at least the transport level. I'm not talking about the services or the operations and maintenance, just at the level of how the actual fiber or cable or copper or wireless gets to your device, your home, your business, whatever. So if you're going to have public infrastructure, again, at the transport la layer, then um, you have to have somebody that owns it. And that's not a private company or that is not um, uh, an entity that is um, beholden to somebody other than the customers. Now, even a private company, the customers, you know, there's a, there's a relationship there. But with a utility, it's a little bit different. Um, so I talked to a lot of people about this presentation. And one of the feed things I, I, I heard from the feedback from people was, Michael, you're in your head too much. This is about winning hearts and minds. And I totally believe that. This is uh, really easy to get into the weeds about broadband because it's a very compli complicated subject. There's lots of layers and, and players, and um, it's, it's just a big ball with lots of moving parts inside. But this is about you know, solving the problem and getting on board um, a solution that a lot of people are starting to think will work. So um, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to bundle together uh, a municipal owner of infrastructure utility as well as a co-op. How many people here know about the Plumas Sierra Rural Electric and Telecommunications Co-op? Quite, yeah, half of you. So just up the road, not very far from here, there is a co-op that's been functioning um, as a rural electric co-op since uh, after World War II and as a telecommunications co-op since um, the, the 2000s. And they have in Quincy and Portola, um, two small towns um, with not a whole lot of people, less than 10,000. Um, they have gig speeds, fiber synchronous to their businesses and homes in certain areas, and they're building out very, very quickly. And the reason they were able to do that is because they built it themselves, and they decided that they were going to do it, and that's what they're doing. Um, so this is a, a video that's geared towards um, municipal um, ownership, but just... Pretend it's co-op. So last summer, uh, Nevada County, which 
you know, the, the Board of Supervisors have been talking about fiber and, and broadband for quite some time. Uh, they were convinced by um, various folks to come up with a pilot program for a broadband grant. And so they decided to do uh, 250,000. 25,000 of that's being administered by the Sierra Business Council up in Truckee. And uh, I believe at the end of October when, is when they opened up the application process um, with a deadline of uh, December 6th, which gave basically um, gave you about a month, maybe a month and two weeks in order to come up with a full plan for a project. So um, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And uh, Jim, you were on that conference call and, and we, uh, Jim with Smarter Broadband, we, uh, we, a lot of us said, you know, this timeline, this deadline is, is just really not very reasonable. How do you expect us to put in an application? And they said, put it in anyways. Just come up with something, get something in there, and we'll work it out. So I took that as a challenge and decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and throw something in there and see what happens. And um, as it turned out, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the application was accepted. And uh, I did a presentation to the city of Nevada City on um, January 8th. And um, they, uh, the proposal is, is, I don't know if, if you know what, what um, this actual project is. It's called the um, Nevada City Fiber Hub for Base Industry and Opportunity Residential Project. And it's basically where the old Grass Valley Group buildings are on Providence Mine Road. And uh, the, the cable will go from um, the fiber cable underground, all underground. Uh, the point of presence connects at a, broad, at a middle mile um, uh, connection on Zion Street, goes into the um, back parking lot there in Building 2, and then up into the Liberty Building at the top of the hill there on Providence Mine Road. There'll be a knock there, Network Operations Center, and then it'll be distributed throughout, throughout that area, um, picking up the old Grass Valley Group buildings, some anchor institutions like the fire stations and the schools um, between there and Zion Street. And there's a, um, a, a development that was approved, I think two years ago, two and a half years ago, called The Grove. And uh, there's 77, 80 units in there. And it would also serve that, that development. Uh, Residential development, that's right. The tech center, Nevada City Tech Center, is in that area, and there's a lot of pads with no buildings on them, and it would also serve those areas. And um, I did this on behalf of the Northern Sierra Fiber Broadband Co-op, which I just made up out of my head, and it doesn't exist. Um, you're actually all members now. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I just said, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to see what, see if we can make this fly. So, um, it, again, it's, it's been receiving a lot of um, support. People are uh, calling me, asking me what this is, what are you doing? And so, uh, this evening got freed up. There was going to be a presentation, and then David called me and said, hey, you know, do you want to do something about that co-op? I said, okay, sure, why not? So, here we are. Um, I was told... Uh, about two weeks ago that there are three finalists for the grant and this is one of them so we're um, we're uh, in the running it, you know there's nothing um, that says that, that it won't be accepted um, there was a comment period that ended on Friday um, we were supposed to hear today who uh, the winning applications are and that's not gonna happen uh, the county is not done so we won't find out until, um, I believe it's going to be uh, the first week of February because they're going to present, the, 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 they'll have a um, supervisor's meeting on the, the 12th, or no, the 11th, and that's when they're going to have us, if you're, if you're a winner of the grant, to get up before the supervisors and, you know, basically get a pat on the back or whatever. Um, ISIS, there's three applications that are, that are finalists. There were three entries, so um, I have a feeling all three are going to get funded. That's just my gut instinct. The other two projects, one is um, 40 homes up on the top of Banner Lava Cap Fiber, 
And then there's a, a wireless project up in uh, Tahoe near Boca Reservoir off of 80. And that's an area where it's pretty remote and the, the ground there is terrible. And so they're, they need to use wireless to get to those folks. Um, and that's done by a company called XWire. Uh, so let's see. Um, I've got a, a slide presentation that I'm going to show you. And um, let's just go ahead and do it. I'm looking at this in terms of uh, who, what, when, where, why, how, right? The six, the six W's. So what and where? All right, so that's the physical boundary of the proposed physical boundary of the Northern Sierra Fiber Broadband Cooperative. You've got the Pacific Crest Trail to the east, Placerville to the south, a little below Placerville, um, Chico to the north, and Sacramento River, Yuba County line, and the Sacramento County line to the west. So you can see, and that's, there's a lot of different reasons that I came up with these boundaries. I won't go into all the details. It has to do with the, um, the, um, uh, the broadband consortium under the CPUC. It matches some of their boundaries. And uh, there's some other reasons. Actually, the, um, how, because it's along the Pacific Crest Trail there, um, to the right of that or to the east of that is where the Pluma Sierra um, uh, broadband co-op is. So, you know, you have these physical boundaries, but you don't want to get into their territory. Um, the way this works is you can do it projects inside the boundaries anywhere you want. Project here, project there, project, project everywhere. So um, you don't have to just do the whole thing. You can do little places and things that make sense. And then the co-op will own the infrastructure and operate the infrastructure based in those various areas. And because it's the internet, a lot of the management uh, can be done remotely. You don't really need to be there. There'll, there'll be some truck roll um, issues, but uh, by and large, it'll mostly be monitored over the, uh, you know, using the internet. Um, when, soon as possible, who, you. So now we're out of, we got four out of the six W's down. We're done with those four. Um, All right, so going back to talking about how broadband is essential utility infrastructure, there's the one that we already know about, and the other one, and the other one. Now what's interesting about these things is that when all of these first came out, they were done by private companies, right? They weren't necessarily considered critical infrastructure. That was like, hey, boy, you, you, yeah, I, Bring a wire over to my house so you know, I'll get a light bulb and I'll have one light bulb in the house. Of course, once it got to the point where you put a 30 amp breaker on the house, because that's how big they were back then, suddenly people were like, oh, how about a vacuum cleaner? That'd be interesting. So the applications came after the infrastructure was, was designed and installed. But it was kind of a chicken egg, so it took a little while. But now the way that this is financed, if you build a development and you know, you're going to have to have water, sewer, electricity. It's required. It's not optional. In a in, I mean, you could go out in the woods and build whatever you want, but if it's in a, in a place in a municipality, it's required to have those three things. And the way that these get financed is, is like a Mellorus bond. Is everybody familiar with what, what, what a Mellorus is? Yeah, it's, so it's, a, it's an instrument. It's a financial instrument and they just sit on the shelf and the developer just comes and takes it off the shelf and says, all right, I'm going to take some of this money, I'm going to build this infrastructure, and then I'm going to roll it into the mortgage or whatever the payoff mechanism. And the user, the end user, the, the customer, the home owner, doesn't even see the cost. It's just built in. That's not how we do broadband. We do it entirely differently. So we need to add that to the Melarus bond process is really what the co-op is all about. So by taking the co-op and having an entity to own the infrastructure, we now have somebody that could take responsibility, a democratically organized entity that can take responsibility for the ownership and, and, and operations of, of the infrastructure. Um, now, 
one of the reasons that, that, that people are looking at this co-op model, um, and you'll notice these slides are from entry point networks. These are the guys that are pioneering this in the Western United States. And I just bumped into them. Um, Jeff Christensen was here, I don't know, about two months ago, three, or no, it was, long, it was in September. He did a presentation and talked about, um, he has a software, their company has a software product that basically what it does, it's that part where, I'm, and I'm gonna get in the weeds here, but um, it's where you take the layer two of the OSI model and you're able to um, provision the data plan, the voice, the content, all of that stuff with this software. It breaks that all down. Yeah, go ahead. Does that do, does that uh, produce the video that you're showing at that entry point? Um, it's a, I, it may be them. Um, there's a bunch of, there's like a, a consortium of co-ops. Okay. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think they had a hand in it. Um, they're doing this, so that video came from um, a website in Quincy, Massachusetts. They're doing a, 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 um, a project in Quincy, Massachusetts for a municipality. So in a lot of places, a municipality is the appropriate uh, entity for, to own and operate the infrastructure. Here, municipalities just really don't want to get involved with that, and that's one of the problems that we have in Nevada County and Northern California. Um, you know, you can go talk to the supervisors and, the, and um, the staff and they're like not interested. Yeah, we'll do solar, but we will not do uh, broadband. Just, it's too messy. And you know, there's also um, a lot of problem with the incumbent saying, you guys can't get involved in that stuff. You're not allowed. You're, you're a municipality and you're competing with us. Co-op doesn't have that problem. We can do whatever we want. It's up to us. Yeah, it came from TOT taxes. Yeah, so that's, and there's money there. So um, this was 250,000 to start. My guess is there's gonna, they're gonna do a follow-on grant, it'll probably be 2.5 million. Um, so the fourth utility. Um, so, you know, we talk about open systems and closed systems. So over there on the right, we have the closed systems. You know, if you want to um, put, a, put some content on Comcast's um, cable plan, you're gonna pay to do that, right? Because there's gonna be a relationship of some kind, but they're the ones that control that. I can't just go and do that. I have to talk to somebody. Over here on the left with the open system, I can put any kind of website up I want. If I, can, if I wanna um, drive for Lyft, I just get my car, I sign up, and now I'm, I'm in that open system. Um, all those other guys, I can sell things on Amazon. I can put ads on Facebook. I have that option. Whereas over there on the closed systems, I can't get in there. Um, they have a lock on it. So what you typically have with the, with the existing internet infrastructure with the proprietary networks, not open systems, is if you look over here, um, the telephone, entertainment, and internet, those are the three, those over there on the right. That's kind of what you, what you get in your bundle. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that right now, it's difficult to get your, your ideas on the internet. You're gonna be over the top. You're, you're not gonna be able to when I say over the top, that's at the application level layer of the OSI model, again, getting in the weeds, but um, you're not able to get down into those lower layers, layers the, the transport and the, and, the, um, and the network layer. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, you know, we, we could be doing better uh, over an open system. And you've all heard about these things. The, the, the increase of automation, Internet of Things, AI, blockchain. Um, this stuff is, is just getting ready to butt bust out. And in a closed system, it's, you know, you're gonna be looking at situations, let's say we have um, a smart home with lots of sensors. And I wanna have a product that, that you know, does all that stuff. So, I look at it, I do the product, and it, you know, okay, I'm gonna have to charge 20 bucks a month to the user to, to provide that service. Well, 
Comcast can say, yeah, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm only going to charge six bucks because I can bundle the real cost in the other part that I'm selling you for the, for the bundle. So by breaking it out, it, you're basically saying, this is what it costs to do the infrastructure, and then the operations and maintenance and the services are separate. That's where the free market gets to, gets to really do its thing. This is a map of um, some of the underground sea cables. Uh, and so the way the internet works is, um, I won't get into TCP IP, but, but what I will say is that there's you know, first mile, middle mile, and last mile. This is an example of some first mile connectivity, major trunks going between cities and countries. Um, middle mile are like expressways, okay, and so you have things coming off of, we have a middle mile project here run by Vast Networks, starts in Bakersfield, goes up through Fresno, Highway 49, and then um, back out to Calusa down 20, and that's where we would tap in for our last mile project, which is where you connect to the expressway and then you put a piece of um, fiber to each premise or a wireless connection as well. Any of you familiar with the Great Stagnation? So this is uh, this Tyler Cowan uh, fella wrote a, uh, a paper back in, uh, it's, it's almost 10 years old, but it's still, I think, quite appropriate that um, for the last 100 years, the low-hanging fruit, we've, we've kind of been able to take advantage of that. Airplanes, roads, cars, um, electricity, plumbing, those things, you know, back in the mid-1800s, you didn't have much, you didn't have any of that stuff. People were living in the mud, and now, 100 years later, we got people flying to the moon and stuff. But those things are done, and um, we're getting ready for another wave, but it just so happens that this next wave is really dependent on this particular piece of infrastructure. So... This gentleman here, he talked about the great stagnation, saying that we've done all the easy stuff and now we've got some hard things to work on. But his uh, opinion is that the internet is just at the very beginning. I totally agree with that. Um, and we'll talk about some speeds and some other things that, that we'll see with innovation. Um, but uh, it, the internet has not been around very long. And whenever I talk to people and say, oh, we're just at the beginning, it's like, well, they, they can't remember when they didn't have one of these things right? But it wasn't that long ago that these things were not in everybody's back pocket. And here's an example of how you can get confused about what the future is, right? So I, I just like that slide. Um, so this is another slide about the open network, open access versus proprietary networks. Um, so, let's talk about speed. So there we have our uh, DSL connection, right? And we have our cable, one gigabit per second currently. Maybe we'll get to two, maybe five. Laws of physics will start to really get us in the weeds on that. 5G, everybody's talking about 5G. Boy, 5G is going to save the world. Laws of physics once again say, eh. 10, mega, 10 gig, maybe a little bit more. And then, of course, you've got the, the, the um, faster you get, the tighter, the, the millimeter waves, the closer you get to the um, spectrum of light. And, um, and you also have a whole bunch of people that are going to line up at your city council meetings and talk about how it's, you know, killing all the bees and stuff. So um, wireless, the thing about wireless and I, I get this question constantly, is um, why bother? They're putting satellites in, in space. We don't need fiber. They're different. Wireless and wireline, wireless and fiber are complementary. They're not competitive. You need both of them. We're going to be using both of them for the next 100 years. And, and they both have a place, but they're... It's one doesn't knock out the other. And here's a slide that kind of talks about that. There. So currently, you can run 25 terabits per second down a single piece of glass. That's 25 
million megabits per second. Try doing that on a wireless connection. Try doing that on anything else. Actually, the, um, I think it was last year in the lab, they had um, a connection at 661 terabits per second. So the thing about fiber, it's a fundamentally different medium. And what it's going to do is once it has ubiquitous application, the, the new ideas of what to do with it will be invented. We don't know what's going to be on there. I think one of the killer apps right away will be um, real video conferencing, where you're sitting in a room, and everybody in that room looks like just like I'm talking to you. I can make eye contact, and I can see. That's going to happen pretty soon. It's all, the technology is already there, but we don't have the bandwidth. But when we get bandwidth like this, not a problem. So this is fundamental to you know, our species' survival for the next 100 years. We need this. I don't care if you're doing art or uh, uh, education, um, healthcare, manufacturing, you know, every single thing that we do in the world as human beings is going to be taking advantage of this fiber infrastructure. Um, so, there's another community uh, in the western United States uh, uh, that um, EntryPoint has um, worked with, and there are, it's operating in, in, in Ammon right now. This is kind of the uh, poster child example that we use um, to describe this. And by the way, what, what EntryPoint does is... Um, they have their software, and there's other companies that do this, so I'm not beholden to, to um, entry point, but I really like what they're doing. And they're, they're acting as evangelists, too. So, you know, they provided these slides to me, just said, go for it, go be an evangelist. Um, so they just charge like a buck fifty per user per month to, to, to build this platform. That's it. So that's what's in it for them. Um, so in Ammon, Idaho, 30,000 people. You can switch your ISP in 30 seconds. They offer a, a 15 megabit per second internet connection synchronous for free. The data plan doesn't cost you anything. A gig is $9.99 a month. <clears throat> and you can create a virtual private network. A VPN, if you use software, you're sitting over the top. Again, you're up, up at that application layer. Here you can provision um, a real, like a, if you call Comcast and say, I have a branch office here and a branch office here. I want you to put a point-to-point -point connection through the internet that's at layer two. They'll say, yeah, we'll do that. We'll put it in our system, you know, a couple weeks later, maybe a month. If it's AT&T, a year and a half later, um, they'll get something there for you. Here, you can get into that dashboard. You go boink, 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 enter, done. Virtual private connection at layer two for free. This is an amp. <clears throat> This is in Ammon, Idaho today. You're paying for the infrastructure. In Ammon, because it's flat and because it's very loamy, it's very cheap. It's about 3000 per premise to, to do the installation. Their model is you pay $3,000, you are done paying for the infrastructure, or you can amortize it over 15, or no, it's actually five years. Um, and, um, and then there's the operation and maintenance, which is about 20 bucks, and then there's the data plan. Now, of course, you're responsible for all the other stuff on top, the phone, you know, video content, home security, whatever you want to put on there, that's all you too. But just for the data plan and, and the companies, Fibercom, QuickNet, et cetera, all they're doing is they have wholesale um, bandwidth that they're reselling. So that's all this is. This represents, I mean, they're not doing much of anything. They're, it's just a provision thing. It's a software Clicky click, boom. But those are the prices. So you can see, again, if you add this thing up, in Ammon, if you're, if you're still paying off your infrastructure, you're paying about $46 a month for a gig connection. They started building the network in July of 2016. And you can see here the change in, uh, in, in what's, what kind of uh, service that they've um, been able to enjoy since they, they decided to do this. They did an overbuild. So an overbuild is where you're, this is what we have. 
right? We've got Comcast, we've got AT&T, and uh, they, have a, they had a company called Cable One. And so they built their network on top of Cable One. Cable One is still in business. So Cable One still has plenty of subscribers, so they coexist. Um, and there's just some folks that just want that bundle, and, that's, and they're perfectly fine with what they get with Cable One. So the thing that's interesting about this is, is you don't need to worry about take rates in order to get this thing done when you do the revenue bond financing model. So let's talk about how much money some of these big companies have. This, is, this slide was done for um, a uh, community uh, mountain, mountain, see that up there in Idaho, Mountain Home, Idaho. And their annual, th the way that they go and talk to these communities is they say, well, this is what your people are spending um, annually on broadband. And so Mountain Home, I, I think they're six, maybe 10,000 people. Um, is that about right? Yeah. Um, pretty small community and very spread out. Um, but they're spending, you know, four and a half million dollars a year on broadband, the people that live there. Um, so the money's there. It's just not being allocated properly. Where the reason that they put these companies in here is that um, this Zito over here is in Pennsylvania. They're one of the providers in Mountain Home, and they're, they have annual revenues of $45 million. Um, but let's look at the two big ones, Comcast and AT&T. Comcast has almost $100 billion in annual gross revenues. AT&T has almost $200 billion in annual gross revenues. And there's a lot of money <laughs> coming from the people in this country who are spending it on Brana. You know, we spend um, uh, at least two times, maybe three, um, compared to Europe and Asia and we get about a third the service. That's rough metric, but um, we spend a lot of money on broadband. <clears throat> We're a fairly rich country, so we kind of don't pay attention to it. We're used to it. People from France come here and they go, what the heck is wrong with you people? This is insane. So those are some big numbers. So doesn't depend on take rates. Usually you look at projects that are privately financed by a um, company, let's say Race, that's come in here. Race, uh, take rates are really key to the success of that project because um, you know, the grant that they got and the money that they're putting in from, from their private investment, they have to take, I think that you know, if they're not getting at least 60%, they're gonna be hurting. So with a co-op model, the take rate doesn't matter. The subscribers and the members are partners in the co-op, so they're owners, essentially. And then the, the success of the co-op has nothing to do with the services. So we don't need to worry about um, you know, the data plan and the video plan and all that. that that's taken care of by others. So I put together a little glossary. Um, I don't want to spend too much time here, but We've talked about wireless and the fact that we need both. Um, the first mile, middle mile, last mile concept. The point of presence, which is where the first mile, middle mile, and last mile connect together. Those are the building blocks. Um, over the top, that's at layer seven of OSI, um, open system interconnect. Um, and you, know, we, you hear a, a lot about cable and cord cutting now. People are getting away from the bundles and they're doing things. Um, with buying their services separately. Um, there's OSI. Um, last time I did a presentation, I think it was in May of last year, I, we went um, quite a ways into the Rochdale principles, which is when co-ops were first invented. Um, there was, uh, it was Rochdale, New York, I think. And uh, anyways, or no, it was in U the UK. But there's a, there's a whole set of principles and you can Google that. Um, yeah, and if you, if you really wanna get into, there's the metal roost, but um, one of the reasons we are where we are today in broadband is because of those things at the bottom. The Communication Act of, uh, Act of uh, 1934 
uh, Telecommunications Act of 1994, and the big one is the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And what happened in 1996, you'll see there it says Title II. Basically, up until 1996, started in 94, but 96 is when it really said, okay, telephony and the internet are going to split. Telephony will remain regulated, internet not regulated. Internet, we need it to flourish, we need you know, thousands of blossoms to bloom, so we're just going to um, let the free market take care of that. And the free market said, great idea, we will provide um, wonderful service and we'll have a ubiquitous access. And we all know how that worked out, not so well. We did not get the ubiquitous access. We're creating bond um, uh, programs that will be like Melarus for broadband specifically. Yeah, and so there's a consortium of co-ops um, and entry points involved, working with some money men, money people in uh, back east, um, and they're just starting to get this rolling. But um, you know, money is starting to get a little bit. Uh, hesitant with the stock market, it's way up there. So there's a lot of money that's looking for the bond market to go to. And, and, they're, and the bond market is looking for solid infrastructure projects that can deliver revenue over a 20, 25, 30 year period of time that's, that's solid, that's known. And they love broadband. They think that, that broadband is a really great way to go. So this gets a little busy here, but basically it it's, it's talks about um, the different types of ownership. So you have your POU, that's your municipal government. You have your IOU, that's PG&E model, where you've got a utility that's private, but it's heavily regulated, or attempts to be heavily regulated. There's the co-op, which is um, a 501c12, that's a, a nonprofit designation for, for utilities under the federal government, and then you have your private co company. So I'm not gonna read all that, but you can see the differences there in terms of, of um, how with a co-op, you really have a great give and take between the owners and, or the, you know, everybody, the members are the owners, so, so there's really not that, um, that conflict that can happen. Um, the books are open, you have to do a 901 disclosure uh, for um, the nonprofit, and the boards are is, is um, a set of directors that are elected within that territory, and uh, you know you don't like what a board member is doing, you can run for office yourself or or um, help get them replaced. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. We're almost done. So there's all of the fiber network co-ops in the United States right now. There's about almost 200 of them. So kind of an interesting map there. Um, what you'll notice is it's mostly rural areas. And in, particularly, uh, in particular, um, in uh, a lot of red states and south of North Dakota, clearly the winners. And uh, look at California or Florida or New York, right? So that's, you can see in California there where all those little blue, those are the projects that Pluma Sierra Telecommunications owns. Those are, that's the co-op up there. So they're right, our, they're our next door neighbors. And I'm actually meeting with uh, the general manager tomorrow, Bob Marshall, to talk about all this. <clears throat> Driving up to, up to uh, Portola and meeting with him pretty much all day. But what's interesting about this map the places that don't have the blue, the places that are white, that's where the money is. Those are where the people that have money. Florida, along the coast, the coast in California, New York. There's a lot of money there. And you know what? The reason that that, that, that model hasn't taken off is that the big boys have really locked down the idea of democratically owned infrastructure. So what we'd like to attempt to do is to bust that open. And we want a nice big blue spot right there in, uh, 
in that territory that I described earlier, and I would like to see the whole of Northern California with that, just like in North, North Dakota. Thank you.